Okay, great. So um, welcome again, everybody. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, my name is Michelle Parker. I am the Vice President of Legislation for the Second District PTA. I've been on the board for a while, off and on. And we are really excited to be doing this meeting tonight. We have two of SFUSD's um, staff joining us. Um, we have Megan Wallace, who is the Chief Financial Officer for the school district. And we also have Anne-Marie Gordon, who is the Executive Director of Budget Services. And we have been talking for a while about um, doing a series for of budget meetings of, of information sharing with parents because the budget is such an important part of what, of how we learn, understanding the budget is an important part of um, being an advocate. If we wanna be able to make sure that we're holding our school district and everyone accountable for serving our kids, we need to understand how it works. And so this is, this is part of that. And so we're looking to, to do a series. Um, Megan will talk a little bit more about what's gonna be in tonight's meeting. And then we're, we have at least one more uh, meeting in this series that we'll do, but we'll see. And we'd love to get feedback from you throughout the night. If you wanna send me an email, I'll put my email in the chat box. Um, if you have other ideas on topics we can cover related to the budget, but really the, the whole idea is that we just want you to feel comfortable in understanding how schools are funded in California, how that trickles down to San Francisco, how to read our budget in San Francisco, um, know how the budget at the district level and state level and district level then apply to your own school, just so you can navigate it more effectively and you feel more comfortable and confident speaking up in budget committee meetings or school board meetings, or even just advocating at your own school site. Um, with your PTA and with school site council. So there's a lot of reasons why this is good, important information for you to know. Um, so that is a little bit of background. And then I just wanna give you um, a quick preview of a couple other meetings we have coming up this month. Um, next Wednesday, and this we'll get some information posted out about this on Facebook later tonight. Um, we're gonna be doing a town hall in partnership with SFUSD and Parents for Public Schools. That's gonna be a pre-K to five town hall with a bunch of SFUSD leadership, just to answer all these, a lot of the questions. I don't know if we'll get them all, but a lot of the questions that are coming up around returning to in-person school, that's gonna be next Wednesday night from six to 7.30. And um, so watch for that on Facebook and we'll put it out on our PTA president listserv tomorrow. Um, and then the next one we're gonna have the following week is um, Rachel Norton and Steve Ann Cook who just finished their time on the board are coming to do a retrospective with us to talk about what their service was like and just share some insight um, and what that, that was like for them and what the board is looking at coming up forward. So watch for those. And we have a bunch more coming up after spring break. So you can look for that too. So. With that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn the time over to Megan and Anne-Marie. Thank you so much for being here and taking your time and what has been a very busy time for you. And also I'm sure it's been a really long day. So we appreciate you taking time away from your, <laughs> your lives and your families to be with us. Well, it's our pleasure, Michelle. Um, so hi everybody. Um, I am Megan Wallace um, and I'm joined um, this evening by Anne-Marie Gordon. Uh, Anne-Marie, would you mind waving your hand? I think everybody can see yeah. you. Yeah, hi everybody. Great. And yeah, you you may end up seeing seeing my cat. That's the family time that may interrupt because he's used to, to playing in the evening. But it's nice to be here. Um, and I may have kids running in behind me and tackling me, So, but you're all used to that. Um, so thank you for having us here tonight. Um, so maybe just to get us warmed up, we want to get a feel for who's in the audience. Uh, I don't know if anybody's played this game before, but it's if you we're going to ask a question, and if if it's a yes, then you turn your camera off. Or sorry, instructions. Turn your camera on. <laughs> if it's a no, keep it off. Um, so maybe just as a as a start, um, can you please turn your camera? Well, everybody start by turning your camera off. And uh, and can you please go ahead and uh, turn it on if you are a uh, a parent? Thank you. Go ahead and okay, and turn off, and then turn back on if you're a teacher or an administrator, I guess, with a school site or um, also in central. Okay, how about a community partner?
Awesome. Okay. And then appropriate for tonight, I'd love to know on a scale of, let's say one to five, how well do you understand budgets? Um, let's start with the five or let's say three, three to five. Five being awesome. that you understand it really well. Is that what yes. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. Uh, and then if you're a one or a two, meaning that this is newer to you and you're really trying to learn something new. Awesome. Anne Marie, do you have any final bonus questions before we run off into the presentation? How about uh, cameras on if you're excited to learn more about budget tonight? I knew she'd have a good one. I think, yeah. I think almost <laughs> everyone's cameras on. That 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 bodes well. <laughs> awesome, great. Thanks, everybody. Well, we are excited to have you here with us tonight. So um, tonight's objectives. I'll, first, I'll say what this isn't. This isn't your standard uh, budget and business services presentation where we're talking about uh, budget projections and giving updates on state and federal funding. Although. Hello, uh, federal stimulus package got passed today. So ding, ding, ding. Um, tonight, we're really focusing on just the groundwork of, you know, key things. Like we want you to have a better feel uh, for who our district serves. We're gonna talk a little bit about the types of schools and, the, and, and students uh, who are represented in our district, how we get funding, we're gonna cover some of our main funding sources um, how do you see those funds in our budget? Um, give a snapshot there. Um, and then Anne Marie, and that's all me, I'll be covering those. And then I'll be handing it over to Anne Marie, covering how funds are distributed to schools. Um, then we'll talk briefly about how decisions are made. So with that, I'm gonna dive right in. So we're starting off with SFUSD at a glance. Who do we serve? Um, well, to begin with, our district is one of many in California, and as you may or may not know, um, we serve over 6 million students in California. We're a big state. Naturally, we're going to have a lot of kids uh, who, are, who are educating, but within that pool of 977 school districts, we're the seventh largest. So that gives you a fe feeling that we're a big fish in a big pond. Um, and we also provide um, a good variety of services in, in addition to the standard K to 12 that you might anticipate. We also provide early education programs um, as well as county programs. So for uh, uh, juveniles and, um, and, uh, and older uh, learners uh, and uh, as well as charter schools. Um, and if you didn't know this, we are both a district and a county, which if you're familiar with our local government, which is a city and a county, this might not come to us as a surprise to you. So we're one of uh, 58 county offices overall in California, and uh, we are led by our superintendent, Dr. Matthews, although I will go ahead and share briefly that if you hadn't heard, he did announce his retirement today. Um, and then uh, also, as I mentioned, we do provide a wide range of services and, um, and this is part, uh, largely because of our county function. Um, so you may have seen uh, these images before. The school district does prepare um, this SFUSD at a glance um, uh, summary document. I apologize, it came out a little bit blurry here, but I did provide the link here. Um, I believe we'll be uh, making the presentation accessible. Uh, you know, go on the SFUSD website and look for, um, you know, at a, SFU uh, uh, facts at a glance is actually what it's called. But the main thing is that we do have a lot of schools within our district. We are a large district, therefore you might expect a lot of schools. Um, but they also come at a wide variety, you know, 64 elementary schools, um, that's actually TK through five, um, uh, as well as eight uh, schools that serve TK through eight, uh, middle schools and high schools, we have 13 and 14 of those, as well as you can, um, as mentioned, early education, county, continuation, and charter schools. 
Um, and we have over 54,000 students represented in all of these uh, different grade lo levels. Um, as you can see here, the vast majority of those uh, students are represented in our TK through five uh, with over 22,000 students. Um, but then also our six through eight, about 9,400 students and over 16,000 in high school. Um, we're also a very diverse um, district. As you can imagine, it's a beautifully diverse city. So our, our, our children are, uh, come from a variety of backgrounds as well. Um, but this does actually raise um, some challenges for us when we think about um, down at the bottom in the blue, uh, we also are serving students who are English learners. Uh, we have uh, special education students uh, who need unique services. And we're also, um, we also have a lot of students who are socioeconomically disadvantaged and therefore we need to provide additional supports to make sure that they're receiving the education that they deserve. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and get into how we get funding into our school district. So first, um, I just wanna highlight um, the pie chart on the left. It represents the different types of funds that we have um, within our district. Um, as I mentioned, we are a district and a county. So you can see in the big blue uh, slice um, that represents our district operating budget. Um, and our county operating budget is quite a bit smaller, uh, but it is 10% of all of the funding that uh, we maintain as a district. Um, we have uh, facilities and bond funds. Um, that's where we maintain funds for a geo bond program, as well as regular uh, maintenance for our facilities. Um, and then as mentioned about early education programs um, and then nutrition programs, we do receive funds to be able to maintain our ca cafeterias and provide nutrition to students um, who need, need uh, meals while they're at school. Um, but the main thing that I want to highlight here, this is kind of the first snapshot of the different funds that we have within our budget. Um, that represents a total of 14 unique funds, but of those, there are four uh, mainly operating funds. Um, and I've highlighted these as the district, the county, early education, and nutrition programs. Um, these are um, the, the funds that we use to provide direct student sources, um, services, excuse me, to our students on a daily basis. Um, so I wanna highlight that um, the main types of money that we receive as a district um, and that I'll be providing the most detail on um, our LCFF or our local control funding formula. That's by far the biggest funding source, um, but local funding is, a a very significant source for us here in San Francisco. Um, and state funding, while that's baked into LCFF, not such a big slice. Um, and then the federal funding um, is a reasonably sized, sized chunk, but I'll also talk about how both those state and federal sources are primarily restricted and are um, more difficult for our school district to repurpose um, for various needs, such as closing a budget deficit. Could you say that again? Which ones are more restricted? Sorry. Um, the state and federal funding um, that is highlighted here. Um, our local funds, we'll, uh, we'll be looking at those more closely. Um, those are more like LCFF, uh, which is uh, much more flexible and where we can make uh, decisions with those funds much more easily. Um, so around LCFF, um, I've actually done something a little bit different here than I've done in the past. And this is with the lens of wanting to kind of lift the veil and make things a little bit more straightforward uh, for the public. Um, and typically, we really focus on unrestricted general fund uh, within our district budget. Um, however, our county office of education also receives some LCFF and our charter schools receive some LCFF. So here I just wanted to highlight the degree of local funding as compared to state funding that goes into these um, different uh, uses. Um, so as I mentioned, LCFF is the main source. Um, it was actually um, 
uh, an allocation model that was uh, envisioned and, and implemented by Governor Jerry Brown back in 2013. Um, and the main thing I wanna highlight here is that it actually is a combination of local and state funding um, that counties do contribute, as you can see in this pie chart, quite a significant portion. Um, and those funds are um, then distributed, as you can see, 531.8 million um, goes to our school district. So by far the largest piece. Um, but we also have 47 million going to the County Office of Education, and those funds were primarily used uh, for our special education programs. Um, and then additionally, um, almost $30 million is anticipated this year um, to be directed to our charter schools. Um, and that's uh, primarily, um, and that's actually the local portion that is used uh, for our charter schools. But I have a footnote here that says that all schools together actually uh, have budgets totaling about $77 million. Um, and the main thing I want to uh, highlight here is that LTFF is driven by ADA or average daily attendance. Um, and uh, while the bulk of the funds uh, are provided to districts in the base grant, uh, supplemental and concentration grants are also provided to districts depending on the number of students that they have uh, who require additional supports. Um, and so you can see in the bottom left, uh, just the exact amounts that are provided, uh, not, you know, it's not a fixed amount for the base grant or the supplemental and concentration amounts that the state actually provides different amounts depending on the grade level. So recognizing that more funding may be required for high school students, for example, than uh, in elementary school. Um, and then on the right, just wanting to highlight that of the LTFF that we received in the district budget, the vast majority, again, as you could expect, is from the base grant. Um, but I do wanna highlight in gray and in dark blue are the supplemental and concentration grants. Um, and those together um, amount to over you know, $60 million that's a sizable portion um, of our budget. Uh, so it's a, it's a meaningful amount that we receive due to those additional grants. Um, here I'm gonna go into um, our local funding sources. Um, so in addition to the amount of local funding that goes into LCFF, uh, San Francisco voters approved uh, three separate funding streams uh, through various ballot measures. Um, the Public Education Enrichment Fund, otherwise known as PEEF, the Quality Teachers and Educators Act, QTA, and the Living Wage for Educators Act, um, LWEA. Um, and I mentioned the rainy day reserve because as I'll highlight, we actually haven't been able to use the LWEA, LWEA funds to date. Um, and so in the pie chart, these major funding streams are highlighted in blue, uh, but you can also see that uh, Spark SF, so uh, private uh, dollars that we've been able to um, re receive from donors, um, as well as other funding streams from the city, like the D2IF, D2IF Excel programs, and then of course, fundraising from PTA, um, those all contribute to the overall picture. So PEEF, if you're not familiar with it, um, is a funding source uh, that was first approved in 2004 and then reauthorized in 2014. Um, and this funding stream is divided bet uh, out to between th uh, three different types of programming. First, first five receives one third of these funds and then the district receives the remaining two thirds, and that has to be split between our sports, libraries, arts, and music programming, um, and then our other general uses, which is really a much more you know, flexible use of those funds um, that the district um, can uh, work to align with our, our current priorities. In the current year, we're anticipating we'll receive about $76 million from this funding source. And then QTA um, was, uh, was passed in 2008, um, was really focused on increasing salaries for our teachers and uh, making other investments 
that are really around retaining um, high quality talent within our district. Uh, so in addition to providing wages, uh, you can see here that we're providing develop, professional development um, and then also investing in technology. Um, the Laptops for Educators program has been extremely successful. Um, and then I don't list it in the bullets, but down below impact and innovation awards are ways to uh, really recognize outstanding teachers. And then for LWEA, um, which is the funding stream that was uh, originally passed through Proposition G. Um, it was a parcel tax that voters approved um, in 2018. Um, however, uh, there was a lawsuit filed against the city um, stating that we, it didn't receive enough vote, votes. Um, and we've actually been in litigation trying to fight to get those funds. Um, it hasn't been resolved yet, um, but in order to make sure that we were able to continue to fund um, our staff um, at the higher rates, um, we actually were successful with passing Proposition J. Uh, so this was for a slightly lower amount. It generates just a couple million dollars yes, less each year um, than Prop G but it is going to, starting in this next fiscal year, 21-22, allow us to make the investments that we had intended to make with Proposition G. Um, and then I mentioned federal and state funding. Uh, just want to highlight the variety of sources that we uh, bring in um, that uh, we do um, the light blue chunk in the top right uh, for CARES funding um, is, <clears throat> is a short-term source, uh, one time, although I hesitate to say one time because we've successfully had, uh, you know, <laughs> subsequently two federal stimulus packages passed, ESER two, and now um, the most recent one that was just passed today, but we're fortunate to have um, this series of one-time sources um, that has been coming in. Um, however, those funds, along with many of the funds listed here, are restricted such that um, we can't simply decide to, you know, say that we're not going to provide a service um, anymore and repurpose nutrition dollars, say, for paying teachers in a general education classroom. Um, we have to use the funds for the purpose that they were intended for um, uh, at the time that, uh, the fun that the budget was passed at the state or federal level. Okay, so that's a lot of information. Now, how do we see that in our budget? So I think, uh, first of all, I just wanna recap that we talked about our various funds. So in the top right, you'll remember we talked about the district funds, the county operating fund, early education, nutrition. Uh, when we look at our budget, that actually further gets narrowed down um, into uh, the divisions. So in the left, you'll see budget by division, where we've got special education, student family and community support, the way it's student formula, that's actually our largest investment as a school district. That's the money that Anne Marie is going to talk about in a minute uh, that gets sent to our schools um, and used in the ways that school sites actually uh, uh, establish in their budget. Um, but then even within uh, these divisions or programs, uh, we get down to another grain size of looking at the exact type of spending. So we've got certificated salaries that really represents our teachers and other folks who uh, develop curriculum, uh, classified salaries um, down in the bottom middle. Uh, that's everything from uh, clerical staff, payroll staff, budget staff, um, to uh, folks working in facilities, um, doing repairs um, on sites. Um, and then, of course, employee benefits, which um, are, you know, health, health care, uh, retirement. Um, and as you can see, those make up the largest, uh, you know, portion of our overall budget. Um, 
So this is really just a snapshot. I didn't go into a lot of detail in terms of what it would look like in the budget, but just really want to highlight that the structure is, you know, going from largest at the fund level to division to expenditure type. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it on over to Anne Marie. All right. So I just have, I have a few slides. I'm going to go ahead and have everybody just take a deep breath um, to kind of transition from one speaker to the next. Um, and I know it is a lot. I, I started, I, I got into the chat a little bit right before I started speaking, but there are some really good questions there that I'm excited for us to, to be able to answer um, shortly. So um, we're going to start with a slide that has a really good kind of walk through with the text of, um, of how funds make their way to us and then to schools. And then from there, we get a few more visuals um, that'll hopefully help put all of the pieces together. So um, on the next slide, uh, we have that visual, or sorry, that description that, um, that really helps to, I think, what's a, to take away from this slide, in addition to getting a bunch of definitions of acronyms, because we know that we have a lot of acronyms that we use and it can, it can be a lot um, to follow, is, the way that SFUSD receives dollars from the state through the local control funding formula is very similar or has, has similarities to the way then that we as a district um, allocate money to school sites using the weighted student formula. So from the state, we start with the state and the money comes to us based on our average daily attendance, as Megan said. For us, when we're looking at how, how to allocate money to schools, we don't look at attendance, we look at enrollment instead. So that's one of the, one of the primary um, differences in, in how the formula works. Um, and then the other component of that is, is that weighted student formula is an allocation based on enrollment and student characteristics. And so we get to choose our characteristics. That's one of the really, really, I think, powerful things about weighted student formula is that we get to choose. Um, but it also means that we can be in a kind of constant conversation about what are the right characteristics that we want to include in those weights. And I do have a little bit more information about WSF. I'm getting a little bit excited and ahead of myself, so I will pause there on WSF and we will come back to it shortly. Um, the other piece here is in addition to the dollars that are allocated through weighted student formula, we have a variety of additional um, formulas basically to allocate staff. Um, and that is includes the multi-tiered system of support, uh, centrally funded or centrally controlled allocations that may be based on the program offerings at a school, um, some are based on, you know, even what Megan was talking about with our, our other, our local funds like the Public Education Enrichment Fund. Um, so there's kind of a whole mix of ways that schools may get additional staffing allocations. Um, and on the next slide, we have a good visual. Um, on the next slide, please. Um, yeah, uh, we have a really good visual of the way that many of these pieces um, come together. And so on the left side, that shows us, um, that is site-based budget, uh, site-based budgeting. So that is, right, weighted student formula, which is in the form of dollars, um, specialty funding, which is things like Title I or pitch funds and then donations and grants. So everything on that, on the left side in darker blue, schools, school budgets see in the form of, of dollars. Um, and then right can determine how to spend on staffing, on teachers, you know, on a secretary, um, supplies, things like that. The right side is primarily staffing supports. And so these positions for the most part appear in central office budgets 
um, because the allocations are determined by those central office departments. So since they manage the budget and they manage the formula to calculate the allocations, um, that's where it shows up. And, the, and so then those supports schools see in the form of staff. Next slide, please. Um, the previous slide, I know sometimes we put a caveat on that slide that the boxes are not to scale. Um, weighted student formula is by far the biggest, but the scale isn't quite right. It's just that's the best way to fit all the words in. Um, so this slide is one of, one of the ways that we've started trying to attach dollars to that graphic. So if you go through this, the categories are a close match, they're not perfect, but starting up at the top, you can see for weighted student formula, and these are our current 2020-21 amounts. Um, so weighted student formula is just shy of $349 million, right? And that's on the left side in the form of dollars. Specialty funding like Title I, Pitch, Miscellaneous other funding sources, that's 13 and a half million, right? And then you can kind of work through this list and see MTSS, centrally controlled allocations, special education staffing allocations. And then the section down in the bottom, those final three, um, those are costs associated with central office. Some of them support, I think, for example, instructional support. That's things like um, the African American Achievement and Leadership Initiative, our Curriculum and Instruction Division. And so within those categories, there's a mix of people who work in central office, right, administrative costs, um, but also services that are then provided to school sites. So that might include professional development for teachers that's offered by Curriculum and Instruction or all of the data conference support that's offered by our research planning and assessment division, right? So there's kind of this balance between, um, even though these budgets are in central office, um, many, basically every, every department, every division is providing some degree of service um, to school sites, right? The budget office, for example, we all support a, a cohort of schools to help when there are issues with you know, making changes to budgets, getting budgets set up, things like that. So this is right, putting numbers to that to that graphic on the previous slide. Um, perfect. Okay. And then these final couple of slides are about weighted student formula. I already said a few things, um, but I think the the intention and the reason why we do weighted student formula is because it is intended to give schools more flexibility in their school design. It is a, it's seen as a really powerful way to, to, um, to really elevate equity in our resource allocation and create transparency across the school district in why schools get what they get. Um, it's become a leading approach, especially in, um, in large urban school districts where you have Right, a lot of students, you have a diverse student population and a lot of right, a lot of decisions to be made about how to allocate funds. And then, as I said, there is no standard, which is both wonderful and challenging because it means that we can we can choose our priorities. We can choose. Right. We, we determine the characteristics that are a part of it. But it means we may also always be questioning, are these the right things? that we're that right that we're adding additional weight to next slide um so this is i i won't spend too much time here because i want to make sure we get to questions but this is one um facet of the weighted student formula the baseline and the baseline itself right these positions do not necessarily appear in a school's budget. Remember, weighted student formula is dollars. But one of the one of the steps in basically processing, right, in putting together the weighted student formula is making sure that there is a baseline, there's a minimum threshold that schools can cover. Right. We don't want a really small school to not be able to pay for 
the minimum number of teachers that it needs. So that's really what this baseline is about. We start with our calculation of enrollment and weights, but then before we finalize anything, we make sure that schools have the dollars to be able to do some of these things. Um, all of these things, but we have, right, we have specific numbers we use to do our cross-reference. And then the final slide um, is just a quick snapshot of the weights that are in SFUSD's weighted student formula. Um, the weights, right, are different. Some of them are larger, some of them are smaller, but the weights that we look at are K to three, kindergarten to third grade, we have an incoming proficiency weight um, for our secondary grades, English learners, special education, and a couple of different variations of socioeconomic status. So I think with that, ah, there's one more slide about our budget approval process. We can go ahead. I don't know, Megan, if you wanted to speak to this last slide. Sure. Um, yeah, just we'll cover it quickly. Um, just wanted to give folks a reference for um, the whole budget process, who makes decisions and when. Um, so this slide, um, although there are some important other details in here, really want to call your eyes to the yellow arrows. <laughs> um, so just uh, this year, we uh, did work with our Board of Education to establish district priorities. Um, that we're uh, working to incorporate uh, into our budget development. So we're really uh, making sure that we're uh, investing in focal students, uh, engaging with students and families, and preparing, as you can imagine, to reopen our schools. Um, and then uh, taking that information, um, fiscal or central, that's really Anne-Marie, me, uh, Young Lee, our Deputy Superintendent of Policy and Operations, uh, worked together to put together uh, to develop our key assumptions that go into budget templates that are then given to our school sites for their own budget development and then central services um, divisions. Um, and in April, that information will be compiled and uh, the fiscal team will work with our superintendent to prepare a budget proposal that then goes to the board for review and finalization uh, in time to be able to uh, have a, buddy, a budget that's ready for July 1, 2021. So I think with that, I'd love to hand it back to you, Michelle, uh, for uh, opening question and answer. Great. Um, thank you both so much. This is um, so much information and people were asking about sharing the slides. And so if I'm assuming that's okay with you, Megan, I will um, share that after this meeting is over. Um, before we move into the, um, there's there's been several really great questions that have posted in the chat. We had some that were submitted ahead of time. We'll just get through as many as we can. I thought maybe it would also be helpful to let people know what we're looking at as for like the content for the next budget. Um, or one one meeting that we'll do just so that people know that there's, there's obviously tons we didn't even get to tonight. This was kind of meant to be the basics, right? Like an introduction to how schools are funded, how SFUSD is funded, how it's distributed, how it's going to show up at your school. Um, and so maybe I'll just share people a little bit in the next one. We have to choose the date, so we'll let you know when that is. But we'll be talking more about how our budget is doing and how we're aligning our investments in the budget in SFUSD with our top priorities. And also, I think one of the big questions is, is how do we know that they're, how do we know that the, um, the investments we're making are having the impact that we want them to have? And that's a big question in the district right now too. And that this, so we'll talk about some of that in the next time we do one of these. So was there anything else that we talked about mentioning, Megan, in our next time we do one of these? Did I cover that? I, I, yep, you did a great job, Perfect. thank you. Um, so stay tuned for that. Um, all right, so um, I'm going to um, start actually just because it's the freshest. Um, I'm going to start. There was a kind of a clarifying question um, on the slide that you had um, with the the what's included in the weighted student formula allocations. Somebody asked if those are listed in order of highest expenditure to lowest. Was there any particular order in that slide? There's there's not. Um... I think it was 
No, there's not a particular, not a particular order that they're listed. I think it was the order that as, as the kind of conversation and brainstorm and just evolution of that baseline evolved, that was the order that they landed in. Okay. Um, great. And let's see, um, again, sort of working backwards here. And um, around the weighted student formula, has that been benchmarked across California districts anywhere? I, I am aware, right? We've got like Sac, 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 Sac City Unified has a, some sort of a weighted student formula, LIV Unified. They all figure it a little differently than ours, but is there anything benchmark across the state or any comparisons you all have done? Yeah, no, Lainey, that's a great question. And we haven't, we haven't done an explicit benchmark to other California districts. I actually, um, several of the, the like education finance groups that I'm a part of um, that there's a lot of, there's a lot of districts that do weighted student formula in other states besides California. Um, some of the notable ones are like Denver, Boston, Indianapolis, I think Memphis, um, Baltimore. So there's kind of, it's kind of scattered throughout the country, but I think that actually doing that comparison and find and and learning a little bit more about the specific funding models in different districts um, would be would be a really helpful reference point. Thank you. Um, okay. Let's see. We're going to kind of jump around because people were posting questions, um, you know, throughout the presentation. So. Um, we have a question about the long-term sustainability of SFUSD. Um, Megan, so governments do budgeting on a finite period cash basis, but to understand the long-term sustainability of the school, one should do an, do an indefinite period economic accrual basis budget, which this is a lot of financial talks. So you might want to help um, translate it for those who are not as familiar with all of that. And so, um, so Patrick is wondering if you can explain how you analyze the long-term sustainability of the district and present that to the board and SFUSD. Yeah, we haven't so, uh, we haven't presented that view in the past. I would say that in our financial statements, we do uh, include our liabilities um, around OPEB. Um, so really, um, like long term uh, uh, costs related to retiree health is a quick way to summarize that. Um, and then, of course, looking at like the values of our facilities and um, how uh, they're depreciating or wearing down over time. Um, and of course, for that, uh, we've been in investing our general obligation bond program as our main line of defense of making sure that our facilities are, are um, being maintained. Um, but it's true. Our... I would say that it's excellent that the state requires us to do um, two years out for our multi-year projections. Um, the city does five years out. Um, so I'm actually, I, I came from the city, I'm somewhat accustomed to that, uh, but I also, um, uh, so I, I think um, that's a great suggestion to look into some of those other ways of having a more holistic um, approach, um, but, but yeah, you're right, so far we're, and yeah, yeah we can I take like 10 seconds just so to clarify the, the notion the notion of the question? Sure. So yeah. you, you don't control your revenues, right? Um, but you to some extent you control your expenditures, not completely obviously, because you have you know, like certain revenues are restricted to expenditures and so on and so forth. But like you can look at just the operations of SFUSD and just sort of look at what what is sort of the cost drivers. And obviously you went to talking about the, the benefits, right? Like we've been paying teachers and, and administrators for a long time in terms of promises of future cash. And as those promises occur, right? Like in some sense, the past has been more expensive than we realized because we didn't pay cash for it. We paid promises and now the promises are due and we're still paying more promises, right? So um, I think it'd be very valuable to just sort of like project out over 10 years or something, just, you know, cost of living, you know, like uh, uh, increases for, for teachers and so on and so forth. Um, most of it is, is salaries and benefits, right? Like just sort of like projecting out what that looks like, um, which is obviously a different exercise than like, okay, we've got to make the budget this year and next year and how are we going to like find the money? But obviously it's a very, very important one given that we have this structural deficit. And I think as one looks farther and farther out that structural deficit is just going to grow, right? So we need to understand what it is, what drives yeah. it, what are the drivers, where are the efficiencies, and so on and so forth. So that's the that's the motivation of my question. Like, how do you look at that and how do you present that analysis? Yeah. 
Um, and, and we haven't done it yet, but I love your thinking. And I, I think, you know, <laughs> I'll say that when I came on board, uh, it was, oh my gosh, we're about to crash the plane. How do we, you know, pull the nose up and, you know, ease this and, uh, and then COVID happened. And so all of that is to say we've, we, I, the board leadership have all been in reaction mode. Um, but, you know, we also need to look at the fact that we've got a whole bunch of one-time funding coming our way. Um, we can see far enough out that we know that there's going to be a cliff after that. So in the second interim report, um, you would see that we're now projecting a $112 million deficit for fiscal year 22-23. Just even getting our head around heads around that is going to be a challenge, but that is just a snapshot because it doesn't take into account the fact that cost of living has in, continued to grow, and that only allows for a 1% step in column for staff. So when will we come back to that conversation again to say, okay, Prop J is great and all, but it's still really hard for teachers to live in San Francisco or the Bay Area. So that's just a very simple, you know, example of something that we're not having a long enough view before we need another Prop J. Um, and I think one thing that really came together for me in putting this presentation together, uh, this is a good learning exercise for me because I was trying to look at things from a slightly different angle. From the local angle, we put a lot of our local dollars in to this big pot of ours, um, but it's been through these one-time asks of PEEF, QTA, Prop J. Um, you know, what would be our bigger vision? Like there's Prop 13 at the state level, that's a good one. Uh, but like another option that we could explore is, um, you know, do we want to be a city and county that um, just funds schools? Um, and, and so that would be a much bigger conversation that we would need to have, um, not just with our board, <laughs> but with our, not board of education, but board of supervisors. So thank you, Patrick. I think that's an excellent question. Um, so keep me on it. Let's uh, keep looking at that longer view. I, I would love uh, to talk to you about it if you'd ever like to. Be very interested to do that. Awesome. Thanks. Um, thank you. Um, thanks for that question, and and thanks, Megan. And um, and I'll just say also that I um, have have attended lots of board meetings and appreciate in general, um, Megan, you and Anne Marie, and generally our our budget staff have been so responsive and willing to to think about. Um, the the ideas that come forward and just really appreciate that. Just kind of following up with what you just said before I move up to the top with some questions I want to make sure we get to um, related to that second interim report you were just mentioning. Um, the district just approved a qualified certification. What happens if and when the next qualified certification happens? And do you want to explain what qualified certification means for those who may not know? Sure. So um, there are three certifications you can submit uh, with an interim report or your adopted budget. Um, so positive, meaning, yes, we'll meet our fiscal obligations, not just this year, but in the next two fiscal years that we're seeing uh, projections of having uh, our sources meet our uses and have uh, sufficient fund balance uh, uh, to serve as a 2% operating reserve is the bare minimum that the state requires. Um, a qualified certification means that any of those three years, we may or may not be able to meet our obligations. So we submitted as, um, as qualified this time around because we're okay this year, We've actually got enough balance that we call it our COVID-19 reserve. It's the pocket of funds that Anne Marie and I turn to when they say, okay, we've got a new school reopening costs. We're gonna use our CARES funding for that. That's our reserve. Uh, we think we have about 4.3 million of that to get us through um, the rest of the year. Um, footnote, there are other funding sources coming in like ESER 2, um, state incentive grants, things like that. So that's, we've got some variety there. But uh, for the second year, we're really leaning on uh, the state uh, with the federal stimulus uh, bill that just passed, um, as well as ESER 2. Um, and so we're, we're optimistic that we're okay for this next, for 21-22, but 22-23, those federal one-time sources go away, um, and that's when we hit that cliff. 
So we went ahead and said qualified, but I'm going to keep championing this. That we're continuing our zero-based budgeting work where we're going to be developing a balancing plan for fiscal year 22-23 when we submit our first interim report in December of this year. So December 20, sorry, December 21-22, um, that first interim report will have a balancing plan for, for that second year. Um, the negative certification just means we don't know what we're going to do. Like we're, we can't figure this out. Um, that's absolutely the worst case. Um, the state actually takes over um, your district um, and your superintendent also is asked to move on. So um, we're, we're early in the qualified status. This is our second time around. Um, and uh, some of the challenges that we have are really just more reporting back to CDE when we enter into MOUs with our labor partners, when we're going out to issue debt, um, we actually need to share our documentation with CDE. So they're, they're just like our parents. They're <laughs> saying, okay, you got in a little bit of trouble. We're gonna keep an eye on you and make sure <laughs> that you, you stay on track. Because if you're making some bad decisions, then we're gonna catch you and tell you <laughs> before you make those bad decisions. So for now, um, it's really more about that oversight, but it's, it's not, we're not in the state of harsh punishment um, at this point. Okay, I think um, Beth has a quick um, clarifying question related to that. Beth, why don't you unmute yourself and you can ask that and then I'll move on to the next one. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. Um, so it's my understanding that when there's a third uh, qualified certification in a row, then there's some negative consequences that happen. And in looking at that, it's like the county then does something. But in San Francisco, right. it is the county. So I just want to uh, understand because right. I my guess is that the third one is going to be the one in December. I just have to expect that that's going to be qualified. Yeah, actually, I mean, I'm, I'm still learning um, and need to keep talking to CDE about um, about it. But, you know, the they're advising that we work with, um, you know, various partners. It could be uh, uh, FICMAT, which is an organization in California that um, supports school districts, helping um, them assess their financial risks. Um, we could also be working with Council of Great City Schools, a number of ways that we can just make sure we're having some partnership with folks, having some third party review of, of what we're doing so we can improve. Um, that's where we're at with qualified. We're, we're, it's like a sliding scale of like being kind of qualified to really qualified and on the verge of negative. We're really at the beginning, although that, that $112 million deficit sure makes me sweat. But um, I would say that uh, we're just continuing to be in close communication with CDE. And uh, I know that Anne-Marie and I are looking for opportunities to engage with partners who can help look over our shoulder and help guide us and improve. Um, but really our third certification is gonna be the adoption of our budget because by then we, we won't have a balancing plan just yet. So really it's the, it'll be the fourth one that uh, we, by that point, we really wanna make sure we've got that plan. Thanks, Megan. Um, so this next question, um, I've, I've heard it come up in different ways in some of the board meetings, um, and it's related to enrollment and its impact on funding. Can you talk about um, specifically what enrollment was, you know, when we went on, you know, at the beginning of the year and um, the question, actually, I'll just read the question that's here and you'll, you'll get where this is going. Um, how many K-12 students were enrolled when we went on lockdown? How many do we currently have? And how many are we expecting in the fall? And how does this impact revenues in the near to midterm? Um, and maybe if you want to, you, you know, talk about the hold harmless and all of that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So um, um, I don't have the exact number um, offhand. So uh, I would love to recite it. The number that I do have really ingrained is we've we've lost about a thousand kids in our enrollment, um, and so in my mind, we do we have to fight to get those kids back. Not just in the fall, if we can't get them back by the fall because maybe they've just left the Bay Area, they've enrolled in other schools, like that is a, a massive risk for our district. Um, but we're not going to feel that. Um, 
ironically, until 22, 23, that year that, you know, it's really, you know, we're facing that cliff because um, the state has built in a hold harmless uh, with the funding, uh, meaning that uh, when we closed our doors in fiscal year 1920, um, we got that ADA level locked in for 2021, as well as for 21-22. It's not perfect because um, our unduplicated uh, pupil percentage, so, um, you know, the, the children who, who have, you know, different needs of uh, being English learners or foster youth, like these components that help generate those supplemental or concentration funding uh, levels, um, those aren't being held harmless. So if, if we do have a lower percentage, then we are gonna see a decline in our funding. Uh, but for now, uh, we're holding our projection steady of assuming that same ADA um, and uh, supplemental and concentration grant uh, funding levels. But so again, it's that 22, 23 that we know that if we don't uh, uh, maintain, at least maintain the ADA that we left with in 1920, then we will uh, see a decline in our LTFF funding. Thanks, Megan. Um, so I'm gonna have, um... There was a bit of a chat, some kind of a combination of questions happening in here. And Josh, if you want to unmute yourself and and combine some of those, what wasn't answered, and it's really around, um, I think, equity um, and, and how we're looking at school sites get funds. Do you want to ask a question, Josh? Sure. Thank you, Michelle. And um, I really appreciate the presentation this evening. Um, the uh, One of the parents at my school, Glen Park, Meg Camerud, um, knows you and says you're great, and I see why. So thank you. Um, I, I, I want to ask a question about school level budgets, not district budgets, though I've learned an incredible amount about district budgets this evening. And you know, obviously, the, the topic of equity is very important to the board. And the board has a certain perspective on what aspects of equity they think are important. Um, I'm wondering how that trickles down to the CFO. Um, and from my very layperson's perspective, I was wondering if there is data on, you know, dollars per student delivered to school that accounts for the different amounts of PTO fundraising at different schools, that accounts for the, you know, student body at a school and the funds that it attracts based on its demographics. We have touched on that a little bit this evening. And then the, the big thing um, is the staffing at a school and the different tenure levels of staffing and how that can have a large impact on how much compensation and benefits money is delivered to each school. Um, my guess based on nothing I've ever read is that if that kind of analysis was done, you would see some extremely different num different amounts of dollars per student per site because of differences in the seniority of staff in PTO activity and maybe on the other side, higher levels of low-income students in, in schools where there are there is not as much PTO fundraising and you have more junior staff. So I'm wondering, Megan, if the, the board has ever asked you to look at things that way or if that's just an independent analysis you've done and kind of if you have a sense of what you think that might look like in terms of a, an equity analysis at that level. Um, thank you for that question, Josh. I think that um, you've definitely touched upon a, a number of issue areas. Um, you know, my kids go to Mira Loma, um, and I, I know that we're, we do a lot of fundraising, and I can see firsthand how um, that results in programs and uh, staff, you know, like we had our, our PE teacher was the best PE teacher in California this year, uh, Ms. Matarazzo. Um, that's because we invested in her as a school. Um, and so I, that's spot on that I can imagine that those school sites that don't have that type of fundraising aren't gonna have, aren't necessarily going to have that type of, uh, of staff who they're be able, able to bring in and retain. Um, and I think this board is very attuned to the equity issues um, at school sites and are looking to uplift um, those sites that need the most help. Um, I think with that, I actually want to see Emery. I, I feel like you're, you, you might be able to speak to this. Can I give you the mic and just see what your, what your thoughts are? Sure. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I do. I think we've at some point last year, we did a per pupil analysis of the of the PTA dollars that um, that are in our financial system. I know there were a couple of questions about, you know, what like what how much of how much insight, how much knowledge we have into PTA PTO funding and really what what we're able to readily see is any funds that a parent organization um, essentially deposits into SFUSD's financial system so that they can support, right, if they're trying to pay for staff or, you know, if there are charges, expenses that they want specifically to funnel through our system, we can see that money, but we can't see money that is, you know, that is held outside of our system. So we get a little, you know, a little bit of line of sight, but not the full picture. Um, but there's, it's, it's, it's a complicated, I think it's a complicated question because I think also what we often see is schools that, schools that do have more fundraising. Um, a lot of times what they pay for are the same positions that other schools are allocated through MTSS, for example. So there's this kind of complicated interplay between, you know, more fundraising um, to, you know, to support positions that some schools do get, get paid for centrally. I think it, you know, it takes some unpacking to think through like what, you know, what that says or what that means and how we respond to it, because we also, there's only so much we can do to, you know, when it comes to what, a, what, you know, parent organizations, um, you know, want to do in support of their students and their school. But um, on the question of seniority, we do um, have schools do budget on an average teacher salary um, because we we don't want there to be any kind of adverse or like you know any kind of complicated. I, I feel like I'm saying complicated a lot, but adverse incentives around um, around the the salaries of staff. Um, and so for that reason, we use an average salary. It also helps create a pretty comparable picture site to site around what the expectations will be for budgeting for staff. Um, we do, our accounting department does do an expenditure per pupil report that I've been meaning to take a closer look at because I am really curious to see how that, how that plays out. Um, and I know I said in the chat that I think that bringing more of that, you know, per pupil cost or per pupil revenue component to our presentations could be, could be really powerful to help frame some of these numbers that can be really big and so it can be hard to really understand what they mean. Um, thanks Anne-Marie and Megan. Um, we're coming I think to the end um, to the end of our time. We're a little bit past 8 30 and we do try to not take up too much of people's time in the evening um, but we really really appreciate you making the time to come here and talk about this really complicated subject. Um, I just put a couple of messages in the chat box um, that if you have other questions and topics you'd like to see us cover in these um, these budget 411 meetings um, just send me a note. My email's there in the chat legislation at sfpta.org and we'll do our best to get those covered and, and help everybody um, become as informed as you would like to be so that you can, you know, be a more effective advocate at your own schools and at, at the district level. Um, and I'll also make sure that I send an email follow up to everybody who registered tonight. So even if you're not a PTA president and normally on the list that we get these out to, um, I'll send a follow up email to you that has a link to the presentation from tonight. Um, and we'll also make sure that when we do schedule the next one of these for the, the budget 201 meeting, um, I'll make sure that you know about it directly since you were interested in this one. So, um, so thanks so much for that. Um, so I think we'll go ahead and, um, and end for the night. Thank you again. Um, thanks to everybody for all the service that you do at your school. Obviously taking an hour to talk about budgets is <laughs> takes some special dedication, but we appreciate you. And watch for the information about the, the town hall for pre-K to five families that we're gonna do next Wednesday. Um, and I also want to just um, do a quick acknowledgement that we had Rachel Norton, former school board member in the audience here tonight. So thanks Rachel for coming. Really happy to have you here and have a few things in the chat. Um, and then also um, Janice Lee, who's on the BART board, was here tonight, which is it's fun to also have her here. So um, appreciate you all both being here and, and everybody else. Okay, have a great night. Bye, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.
Okay. Very nice job. <laughs> Thank you, Beth. for coming. All right. Thanks, Megan. Appreciate it. Thank you, Michelle. I, I thought that felt good. They're good. a good audience. <laughs> it, it was a good audience. They had good, really good questions. And, um, yeah. and there are more. We didn't even get to, you know, some of the others that we had in the, um, the, in the registration, which all came after I sent you that note, like just what, like 24 hours ago, whenever it was. So, um, yeah. but most of it got covered in here, I think. Um, people are just wondering why we're such a big hole. And I don't know if we've totally got to that, but it's, you know, we will. Yeah. Next one. Yeah. Well, and thank you. Actually, I did want to say that I realized that I did the what what we're not doing tonight, but I didn't say what we were doing for the 201. <laughs> That's okay. So, thank you for completing that picture for me. <laughs> well, you know, it's, um, yeah, it's it's good when we can tag team, right? Like you can't think of it. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. But thank you. Excellent. Okay. Well, go have a, a good All rest right. of your night. Um, and I'll talk to you later. Michelle. And we'll find a time. I don't know when it will work for you, but we can just work by email when we want to do that. Okay, that sounds okay. awesome. All right, thanks. thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.